Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Mutual Friend Podcast. I'm Dre. And I'm Gabe. And today, we have a special guest. Would you like to introduce yourself, sir? Uh, I'm Matthew Duncan. Some call, Dunk. me, some call me Big Dunk. Some call me Voodoo Love Child. But whatever you want to call me. Mm. Tell us a little bit about yourself for the audience. They don't know you. Uh, I'm, Get close with them. I'm 21. I live in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm a photo cinematographer, I like to call myself, and I am a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm here to learn some stuff, maybe educate a little, have a good time. Love that. So, the topic for today is black spirituality, and honestly, this topic is going to go on for quite a while, because it's a very important conversation, and as you said, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, but there's many people who look like us, who are black, who might not be followers of Jesus Christ simply because there's many stereotypes and um, some things that are true, honestly, about Christianity, Christians, the church that stop people from wanting to be Christians. And we're going to talk about that over the next few episodes to hopefully shed some light on some of the the issues that the church has had over the years and uh, just kind of just dive deep into those things. So. You guys have anything to say about that? Go ahead. I'm ready to get to it. Should 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 I just get to it, or you want to? You you take get it to somewhere? it, bro. All right. Uh, yeah, I I always say a big part of that, uh, just the going to church experience. Like, a lot of the times, people in the church will make a bad experience for newcomers to the church, and that'll turn people away, and that's not right. What kind of experiences are you talking about? Just, I feel like the way, I feel like we need to be cognizant of how we speak to people and how we treat people so that they feel as if they are a part of a family, a part of a body, Mm -hmm. instead of, you know, like talking down to people or just making people feel uncomfortable and out of place. Mm -hmm. Because I've experienced that personally. Just share. I mean, just that. Like, I've been to church and felt unwelcome just by the people in what there. kind of church what do you mean <laughs> <laughs> what what race was predominantly at the church i mean white but <laughs> but i mean it can happen in black churches too for real like we all need to you know make a conscious effort to make newcomers feel welcome not necessarily pandering to people's emotions and feelings and whatnot but like if at the end of the day we are supposed to be a body and a family we need to make that known and felt. I think uh, one of the biggest ongoing issues, like in our society, I mean, honestly, like over the whole world, is racism, right? Mm-hmm. Inequality based on uh, the color of your skin. Mm-hmm. And you would you would hope that the church would be a place, a community where that wouldn't be there. But mm-hmm. unfortunately, church is sometimes one of the places where you have the most racism most um, hatefulness. Um, Why do you think that is? Or is that even true? It can be. I think it's cultural differences. You know, Mm -hmm. growing up in a black church, like I grew up in a black church, but then I went to like a predominantly white school for most of my life, like as we all did. Yeah. So it's like, you get, we're kind of, we're outliers in this situation because we, we're black, Right, mm-hmm. obviously, and we're we're around a predominantly white school where it's not so much that we don't agree on on our cultural beliefs and what on what we stand on, which is God and Jesus, and He died and rose again for all of us. But it's um, it's hard to explain. It's hard to explain that the ch- the black church is very close-knit, family-oriented. My experience, the white church is more friends, Eh, all happy. It's Mm. more, it's not so much family, it's more, we're all friends. Interesting. I never thought about it like that. That sounds right to me. (laughs) (laughs) Like, we're not supposed to be friends. Like, you're supposed to be my brother. You're supposed to be my sister. You feel me? Mm. I think that's part of, unfortunately, I think that's part of, like, keeping a distance you know, like, there's a lot of people who are white who say that, oh, 
I'm not racist. Mm-hmm. But like I got there's still crime. there's still like a distance between them and us. It's a cultural divide for sure. Yeah. I, I got I got a question about how y'all might feel about a certain topic. Like of course racism is bad. How do y'all feel about people who say like I don't see color? Like like some people say that we need the cultural diversity and to understand that we are different and then other people say like you shouldn't even view it like we're different because we're all humans how do you what do you look at the importance of that i i understand what they're trying to say but it's not so much you like we all see color like i see that you're right. like black mm-hmm. and right. you're white it's like but I why don't do you see care that if you're white if you're black. i don't care that's that's different like we we all brothers and sisters that's all i care about mm-hmm. that's how i see it at least but why do you see that I'm black? Where did you learn that from? My eyes, like I see it. Oh, really? Yeah. This is a thought like that a lot of people like bring up. Like you don't, you have to teach a child like racism. You have to teach a child like the difference between black and white because like as, they a, don't think as about a kid, it. they don't think about it. They're like, oh, you're just another kid. It's like when we're conditioned as we grow up to learn yeah. these these things. Um, but it's still true though. Like I don't think you can be colorblind. Right. And if you Unless are you're acting on the well, yes, but. no, but even you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> because there's still things um, that happen. Okay, let me say about this. As a white person, choosing to be quote unquote colorblind is also choosing to be blind to some of the uh, blatant racism and subliminal racism, honestly, that happens in society, because you're saying, oh race isn't a thing therefore racism cannot exist but it does you know what i mean yeah um so i think that's a huge problem within christianity as a whole is we're so split between this idea of black church white church and it's hard for us to unify because we a lot of white people don't want to admit that there's problems in society relating to black people whether it's there is no racism or all something like that or in black people like oh we don't want to mess with white people because we just don't like i feel like both of those are bad thoughts that goes back to what i was saying about just making people feel comfortable like intentionally like i said not necessarily pandering to people to make them you know fit in wherever they are but like make people feel comfortable let them feel that you care Jesus is coming back for the church, not the black church, not the white church. He's coming back for his church. That's true. So we just got to be, we got to be united front, and it's just, it's not where we're at right now. Yeah, sadly. yeah. I think it's moving in a, in the right direction though. I think like over the last couple of years, um, you'd have to really live under a rock to not have to be challenged with the idea of racism, no matter what color you are. Mm-hmm. I think people have really had their eyes open to see like racism is deeper than just calling somebody the n-word and lynching like mm-hmm. racism can happen systemically or subliminally um so i think that's very interesting but you also have to think on this on this note um jesus coming back for the church not the black church the white church um but just among bringing people into the family there's i think there's a wall that a lot of black people have because they don't even want to associate with christianity because of all the things we just talked about because of racism and all these other things. So why do you think, I mean, other than just saying racism, like why do you think a lot of black people are opposed to Christianity? Mm. Yeah, because it is viewed as, uh, it's viewed as a white thing, but I feel like a lot of people view Christianity as a Republican thing. Mm. Mm. Like That's interesting. And it, it annoys me when people that don't speak from a place of having Jesus in them and, like, just totally crazy stuff, like, are masquerading as Christians because it makes Christianity look bad. Like, it's a lot of false representatives and stuff, especially in, like, politics and whatnot. I'm like, I'm like, dang, now they're going to think that that person represents how we feel. And it's like, they're crazy. 
I see it. I, 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 I agree with you mm-hmm. wholeheartedly. I think it's uh, politics has definitely, uh, like, they, they say separate church and state, but they want to bring church into it, as they should, because church is, church, church is needed. You know, we just don't have enough, we don't have enough leaders that truly show love, which is our first, that's what Jesus asked of us, you know, love thy neighbor as ourselves. We don't have enough of that in this world today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what you said is really, really true. Um, people associate Christianity with white or Republican. Um, I kind of want to just hang on the idea of like white. Mm-hmm. Okay, why is Christianity associated with whiteness? Well, I read this article the, uh, today, actually. Okay, it's so um, And uh, <laughs> it was talking about, well, Frederick Douglass, I'll, I'll talk to you all about this, but Frederick Douglass said, that uh, basically they they were all taught like as, as slaves like they weren't given the whole Bible and they were taught it by the white man you know what I'm saying so th- they were taught it in a distorted way you know they weren't taught the real love of Jesus they were taught what they were told by the white man so that originated that and then you gotta think you gotta th- put yourself in those shoes of those slaves back then like they were taught about Jesus that loves them all but we're enslaved by these people that treat us terribly and we're just supposed to follow them blindly because we're slaves to them. I mean, I can understand why it's hard and that why that stuck around for generations because, you know, those elders, they teach those kids and those kids pass on those stuff to, to their generation. It just keeps going down the path. Yeah, and it, it becomes kind of now you're adopting the religion of your oppressors. You know? that, that's kind of what I was going to say is that the modern leadership and representation has kind of come from a place in the past that was more controlled. And like, even though the current state of our lives isn't the same as it was, just the trickle down of what we have in front of us now is like, we'll see certain leaders or like I said, representation who are white, like pushing certain ideas. And like, maybe we don't get enough of seeing people like us doing it, and so we don't resonate with it the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think representation is everything. Mm -hmm. When we see in society everybody who claims to be Christian or loving God, nowadays, like you said, all you see are white politicians usually. Or if you do see like genuine church leaders who also happen to be white, whenever it happens, whenever we start dealing with an issue that might affect race, there's like quietness so then you start to see like do they actually care about us is this something that we can really uh be a part of but honestly i think like you said representation kind of it's kind of it's kind of like an umbrella over everything like throughout history since you know the time of colonization basically like mid 1600s since then the representation of of jesus has always been white and I mean that, like, literally, not just, like, Christianity, but, like, Jesus himself, mm-hmm. shown as white. All the church fathers, shown as white. And I think that imagery has stuck and resonated with lots of people, or everybody, really, honestly, throughout this time. It's not really until more recently, over the last, what, 100 years, maybe, that people are starting to kind of look at that and say, is that really true? Mm-hmm. So, any thoughts on, like, that idea of, white jesus i never i never grew up thinking like jesus was a white man it's just i mean i'm lucky enough to grow grow up in a household where we were we were taught the gospel i went to two christian schools in my life only been to two christian schools i went to a predominantly black christian school from like the age of four to the age of six seven and then went to a predominantly white school christian school from then until graduation and it's just at a young age i was just taught you know, like you, the picture books I saw were black Jesus. And it's just, I never, mm-hmm. and then I never really saw it any other way. So I'm, I'm that's how I see it at least. That, I feel like that's a unique that's upbringing. Unique. Yeah, I never heard someone say that that was mainly what they saw growing up. Because, yeah, like mainly I saw images of a white Jesus. And I never really cared. Like, it doesn't make a difference for me. It doesn't really affect the main principle for me but i definitely understand how it could be damaging to other people and white jesus and just a representation of the church as being a predominantly white thing like even if you watch 
certain movies. Like, imagine, like, you see a church and what they're showing you a church is supposed to look like. It might look a certain way and affect your view on, you know, how you could fit into that picture. Right. Um, yeah, that's unique. Yeah, I never because heard that. I've also seen, like, whenever I would see pictures of Jesus, it was always, like, a white guy. Mm-hmm. So as a child, I'm hearing about this concept of Jesus, and I see this white character. I'm like, it just, you know, I might, I might not think, okay, well, historically, he might not have been white. That's what I'm thinking as a child. But still, like, even though I'm, I'm seeing that all the time, though, still. And I think it goes, I mean, you can you can think about this in something not as serious as Jesus, but just, like, okay, growing up, Love superhero movies. Yeah. Not a single black character. So me growing up, I'm associating power. heroism, power, manliness with a white image. Weren't we just talking yesterday about Superman? About mm-hmm. yeah, see. What yeah. were we saying? Now you brought it up. You said um like a black man created Superman and then the ideal was taken. Yeah. Yeah, see. Well actually it was uh the Matrix. I think, it was, I think we oh Neo, Neo, yeah, yeah. I think when uh, when Will Smith supposed to play Neo, I think so. I believe so because mm. uh, originally the movie was written by a black woman in like the eighties. Mm. It was like a book, but and she sold and she was talking to she wanted to get it like made into a movie, and so she talked to all these companies or whatever, and she and they took it from her basically, and they never gave her any credit and then recently I, I just saw the video not too long ago but recently they, she was just trying to get it back and everything just to get like credit for it at least mm. but like they took the whole story because it was a mixture of like the Matrix and Jesus like Neo was like supposed to be if you've seen the movies you'll understand so Jesus was, Jesus and Neo like represent each other within it but yeah that's a whole nother rabbit hole <laughs> yeah but that shows representation matters. I think we've been so conditioned to just see like white people. I mean, even, even think of this, right? Um, history class, all white people until you get to slavery and then now some black people start showing up. And I feel like honestly, there's, there's a little bit of revisionist history going on when it comes to like church history because um, everybody you see in church history are depicted as white people. Mm-hmm. But, like, you look into where they're from, what their names are, like, all that stuff. You're like, wait a second. These people can't be white. Just, cause, just simply because of the location that they came from. Um, but you know what I mean by revisionist history? Like, of people course. going back and just, like, putting it, like, making history, honestly, like, in their image. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's something that... Um, white supremacy culture has done it has gone at and took history and tried to shape it in their own image like i just told y'all with the picture with the dude uh cesar borgia his dad was like the right. pope yeah. pope alexander the fourth and they wanted to they wanted a more european looking version of jesus because they knew he was a jew so he wasn't italian like them and so they used his son, Cesar Borgia, who was a prince, as the image that they would like use the, when they wanted to paint pictures of Jesus in their mm-hmm. image. That's crazy. That is. Man, stealing stuff. There, yeah, it's, it's so <laughs> arrogant to, to be like, you know, we're, we're just going to do this, and then everyone is just going to have to pick it up because we make the rules. That's so arrogant and crazy. Yeah. But how does that affect, how, how do you, okay, yeah, how does that affect people today? Because that's all we've been fed, like, we, we, we're not even met with the idea to challenge that image, because it's not even thought of to be something to debate over, they just push it like, this is all there is, hmm. and then it's like, yeah, a distraction, like, subconsciously, it makes you feel like you're not going to fit in with this idea of what they got going on. Right, because you can't see yourself in the story. Exactly. Which, yeah. Like, I remember, like, when Black Panther came out, like, a bunch of a bunch, of, a bunch of kids, like, were saying, like, it inspired them to, like, see someone that looked like them 
doing cool stuff and yeah. being empowered and like being brave and stuff like that. Right. And it's like you don't even think to yourself we need something like that yeah. until you get something like that and it does that for you and yeah. it's inspirational. So like in the in the case of like being shown like a white Jesus, it's like I'm not even thinking to myself we need to see a black Jesus. I'm just right. like taking what is put in front of me and like if you just take what's put in front of you then subconsciously it's gonna do things to you yeah like you just have to have the personal you know the strength to just see around it and move around it Mm -hmm. and determine whether or not it matters to you really but like for a lot of people especially young people it automatically puts you know a feeling of being uncomfortable in you Mm -hmm. i would say right And honestly, I feel like it's affected, I feel like it's affected white people too, but in an opposite way, because now you're seeing a white Jesus and you're associating, you know, whiteness with deity, whiteness Mm -hmm. with value, power, strength, Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And then unfortunately, what's also been tied to that has been this idea of obviously like supremacy, because it's like. Look at all these great things we've done throughout history. Literally, the Savior is white, you know? And they might not think of it in a racist way. They might not say, like, oh, you're less than. But, like, subliminally, though, that's really what's happening. Um, And then also, I think it's tied into, like, especially here in America. Actually, this is all I can talk about in America because I haven't lived anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But nationalism and Christianity go hand in hand, unfortunately. Because people, how many times have you heard the phrase... God and country. Yeah. God and country first. It should not be like that. It should be God first, God, period. Like, not like your country and God are on the same level, you know? Honestly, your faith in Christ should be ahead of your nation. Like, it should, your identity should come in Christ, not, like, the flag. Have you seen that? I don't remember when, but I got to a certain age where I was just like, they were really making us pledge allegiance <laughs> yes. to the American flag. Why? And I, I was like, I was like, are they still doing that? I think they're yes. still doing that. That's crazy. Are. I pledge allegiance to the Bible. I, I wish we kept doing that, bro. Mm. But really think about it. You're pledging allegiance to a flag. That's crazy. That's like, crazy. I, didn't, That's like, I never would have even thought that that was crazy because it's just what mm. we do. Mm. It's just put there and then we just pick it up. Mm. It's crazy, though. But you know what that really is, though? Mm. It's idolatry. It's it making your country and your nation an idol. And I have no problem with people being proud of where they're from and no problem with people like being grateful for living where we are. Because obviously, we've all been to different countries. Mm. We are blessed to live where we're at. Like I'm not throwing shade at America for that reason. But to put it on some pedestal that it should be like up here with God, no. Nah. And that that's honestly, this is one of the great sins that white people um, are guilty of: um, arrogance and idolatry. Of idolatry in the sense of white supremacy, thinking I'm supreme, mm-hmm. and then idolatry in the sense of. Uh, putting the nation so high um and by putting the nation so high it's really putting myself up there so thoughts i'm that's true that's, don't, you just spit some bars bro. <laughs> i am a lot of you just spit some bars but it's it's true <clears throat> i'm I, I never i never thought to see it like god and country same level because i was just thought like could me naturally i would just think god and country when i hear that you know, but when you explain it like that, I see, I see what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, because it's hand in hand. Think of what we learned in history class of what um, the colonizers were thinking when they were coming over here. It was this concept of manifest destiny, which is God is giving us this land to take over. No matter who we have to move out, slaughter, and kill, this is what God is like ordaining us to do. You've heard this before. That's part of white supremacy linked with Christianity. Somehow, even though clearly they don't go hand in hand, but it's been turned that it's it's a distortion, like Frederick Frederick Douglass said. 
a distortion of the truth. That's such a setback. To me. It's such a foolish setback to me. Like, racism as a whole is just a foolish setback to me. Yeah. Like, like say you're a white man. Mm-hmm. And, like, you just don't feel comfortable around black people or you don't like black people, hate black people, whatever the case is. And so now you refuse to engage in a conversation that could have maybe changed your life because the person that had that information was black. Mm-hmm. Like, you're just holding yourself back. Yeah. You're stopping your own growth and you're stopping your ability to help others grow, too, just because, like, it's, it's just so mm-hmm. dumb to me. <laughs> Yeah, racism is stupid. It's dumb. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing. Um, we're all sinners. So you, we can't be surprised as believers for there to be people who are, who are sinning. Mm-hmm. Right? The problem is when you have believers who are doing it. Because when we're believers, we're supposed to be a family, right? Uh, we're supposed to, like Galatians says, in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile. Mm-hmm. Right? There is no male or female. There is no... Uh, slave or free right Mm -hmm. so what that means is it doesn't matter like where we come from what our class is what color we are even what gender we are we're all one and unified in christ there's no one who's less or more human or less or more christian because of things they can't control like that but what happens a distortion a distortion we've been programmed since a young age to we are, we are taught all these things. So when you tell someone that tr- if they've been, if you tell a child something all their life, but then you tell them, and then basically, and let's say they're believing that lie, and then you tell them the truth one time, it's gonna be hard for them to accept that truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that just clashes with what I've been doing. So it's like, right. it's it's harder to accept it. That's why the pre-programming and the subconscious stuff is so big because it's put in place by people. Who probably went through it themselves too mm-hmm. like this has been programmed in me from a young age subconsciously now i'm grown and i'm influencing things and i'm gonna put in place things that are gonna subconsciously affect the next group yeah. it's just a cycle right and i think what were you gonna say them? i was just gonna say like it's just like if, if i told you your whole life that one plus one it equals one and then someone tells you one plus one actually means two you're gonna be like no it's not Mm-hmm. Like you're lying to me. Like mm-hmm. why? Why would you do that? Because your foundation. Yeah. Right. So, but if your foundation is in Christ, then you have you're 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 able to speak that truth. You're able to be used as a vessel by God if your foundation is in Christ, and that's what we're called to. That's why we're called to be separate. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm gonna give the benefit of the doubt, right? Just from the people that I know, and that we all know, um, most white Christians aren't intentionally going to be racist, right? And from the people that I know and I've dealt with and I've talked to, whenever I bring up this topic with love and grace, usually there's some receptiveness because they're like, oh, shoot, like like you said, I've never been told this I before. I just don't know, yeah. And once you like kind of say this from a, from a biblical perspective, I've found a lot of times they're like, oh, shoot, like this is a repentant, a repentant moment. You know, for me to try to not only turn around from a false ideology, but also try to intentionally be active to try to tear it down within the people that I know and um, my family. And unfortunately, um, people who aren't believers who are, who are white and who are anti-racist, right? You have your far left liberal folks who are against racism. No problem with that. But I'm just saying, like, sometimes it's easier for them to try to shut down racism than a white Christian, which is unfortunate that someone who is in the world, who doesn't even know Christ, will be quicker to stand up for injustice and say, hey, that's wrong, the way you're treating somebody, than a Christian. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we have to change, we have to change that. And I think that happens by, one, being loving, right? Making sure everyone feels welcome into the family. Mm-hmm not being hypocritical as black people because a lot of people like us are we talk about how racism sucks but then we're also being prejudiced towards people so yeah yeah like like you said like when you just bring things up to people that they maybe didn't even think about before it's like like if you just wouldn't have thought of it then you 
couldn't care. Right. So this is why it's important right. for us to have these conversations. Because, mm-hmm. like, cause like, if I'm white, like, from my perspective, I've never experienced none of this stuff. I would, I'm not even thinking about it. So right. that's why we have to have conversations amongst each other. And it's right. very important for, like, parents, too. Because, like, if you're if you grow up in the, in the deep south, Mm-hmm. And you're and little Lily Billy's told, "Hey, you can't play with that dude down the street." I mean, that's just that, that's just instills you. Like, why shouldn't I play with him? You know what I mean? You ever seen? You guys ever seen uh, Martin or not Martin? Well, Martin. Yeah, it's Martin. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, Mar- it's like a cartoon Martin Luther King movie. No, it was, I, I saw it in class in elementary. It was like, and Martin had this friend, a white friend, uh, Martin Luther King, in the movie, and he was he was friends with them. He played with them like. Every day, mm-hmm. until his dad saw him, until the white kid's dad saw him playing with Martin, and said, you can't play with that, you can't play with him no more. Mm-hmm. And then Martin never saw him again. And that was how the movie ended. Martin was just sad. And it's like that's a real thing. Some parents out there are like that. Like you can't play with that certain just because of this. Or, I don't want you around that. It's, they give the excuses. Ah, I don't really like that neighborhood they're in. I don't want you hanging around there. Oh. You know what I mean? Like that's Jeez. real stuff. Yeah, that's true. Like for instance, not even playing my family on blast. Like, I, like I didn't have friends coming over. I didn't have friends coming over a lot because honestly, our neighborhood wasn't the safest. You know what I mean? Like, if I'm wanting to hang out with some of my right friends, I had to go to their house. Like, it was just not. It's not. It wasn't something that happened. So. Man, I'm. That's why I love my parents. To be honest, man, like. When I was in kindergarten, man, I had, like, all white friends. And, like, for my birthday, when I was, like, four or five or however old, they all came over. And I didn't even think, of course, because I'm so young, I wouldn't even think that my parents would have possibly had a problem with that. And they never made, you know, anything seem like that. Always made my friends feel comfortable. Like, that's a good thing. That's interesting because I grew up differently because, like, you guys, you know, you guys went to the school early on mm-hmm. but like i was at indian hills which is a euclid mm-hmm. up until like fifth grade or something so like up until then i had no white friends all my friends were black my family i was really close to my family all my family was black the only non-black person that i was ever hanging out with was ethan yeah he was asian but so that was your best friend though. that was my best friend that's true but that was my only like non-black interaction as a child so coming to first RTS where there was still like a bunch of black people so like and honestly our class like mm. was so small but a lot of them were black so like I didn't really think about it it wasn't until I got to Cornerstone that I was kind of like faced with this concept of like I was really faced with the whole white black thing because I was around more majority white people who were not the greatest so <laughs> that is it, it's really interesting because the way that you guys talk about that because I didn't really experience that as a child. Like, it was pretty much all black. Now, at RHCS, though, like, we had a lot of girls, though. So, like, it was a lot of black girls, but, like... Uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but, like, but like since we were so young, uh-huh. and, like, I think it was, like, me, you, and George at one point. It was, like, it was, like, three black dudes, and then, like, all the other dudes was white. Mm-hmm. So, like... I don't know. It was it was strange. And then when I transitioned over to Cornerstone, I feel like I w- I was already cool with some of the people that I knew because like Jared was there and Jared's white, and so like I was with the white kids for like a I good see. amount of my life. And then like I started being friends with black people like later in my life. I see. So I don't know. And like I said, I really wasn't even thinking about it. Like it didn't matter. Right. To me. I mean, I wasn't thinking about it either. Yeah. I'm just I'm just making an observation like as a kid like it was pretty much like all black people mm-hmm. like there was no real exposure other than with Ethan to any non-black culture. But like for sure, when I started getting more black friends, I was like, oh, I feel a lot more comfortable here. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. just just because y'all like get it. That's a fact. I see. That's a fact. But I think I think the root of that is because unfortunately a lot of white people don't want to get it. Whenever yeah. you bring something up that's talking about, like, hey, like, this is how I'm feeling. This is the kind of stuff that I have to go through. Then now it's like, oh, you're attacking me. Like, I'm not racist. Yeah, bro. I I, I really dislike. <laughs> I really dislike when it's like, you're attacking me. 
Why are you coming at like I'm not even I love that me. that voice you just threw off. <laughs> Why are you attacking me? This is gonna be so problematic. <laughs> like it's if I'm staying like you enslaved us, dog. Like <laughs> <laughs> you enslaved us. Are you am I, I'm not supposed to like talk about it hey. now? Like I'm just bringing up the fact of what your ancestors did. <laughs> you funny dude. You said you enslaved us, dog. So, I mean, yeah. but look, but look, this is the point, though. Um, I wrote this down. To be a black Christian among white Christians requires forgiveness and reconciliation, a display of Jesus's forgiveness in a way that no other people group has to do. Yeah. So, although we were just joking around, like, hey, y'all explain those, like, also, I mean, we need a reparation. But, but, secondly, though, um, we do need to be able to to forgive and and reconcile but it's two parts forgive doesn't mean i forgive you and then like act like nothing happened right but the second part is reconciliation which is like making sure that everybody understands that we're on the same page and then making sure that we're doing we're taking the necessary steps to make things right you know and i think for us that means we can't segregate ourselves from people who aren't black we have to show just as much love that we want to receive from them like we need to be able to make friends like you know i love making friends with all sorts of people you know no matter the the color and such um but that also means that they need to do their part and taking the step to uh change the narrative um, around what it means to be white and black as a christian because they have influence on their people that we don't have because we might go to someone and then they're like, you're attacking me. But if they go and they're telling like another one of their white Christian friends, hey, like. Which I'm biased. Yeah, they're like, oh, shoot. Because they'll actually, they'll, they might listen more because it's just coming from one of their own. And um, that's that. How do y'all feel about the 4th of July? <laughs> um. It is what it is, man. It's another thing. Here's the thing. I never really was into that. Like, my family was never really into the 4th of July. Um, as a small child, we used to go see fireworks and sewing, like, with my other cousins. But it was really more just, like, not an excuse, but another reason to get together. Big party. Okay. That's pretty much it. Yeah. But as far as the actual meaning as, like, freedom and stuff, we never celebrated that. Hmm. Because... For obvious reasons, like we were not free at the time, so I know from seeing a lot of uh, you know Caucasian friends who mm. celebrate Fourth of July, that holiday means something to them. They're like, yes, this is some, freedom. Some people, it's their favorite holiday. Like for them, like it stands for freedom, liberty, and justice. Like the concept of America that sounds great. Like it, they get to celebrate that, which is no problem. Like, I don't have a problem with that. It's just. For us, for me, for me, I'm speaking for me. To me, it's like a reminder of what a great idea America is and what it what it can be. Potential, but yeah. it isn't. It's got potential. Yeah. I'm gonna tell y'all. I've recently had a change of heart on the Fourth of July. I previously was like, this don't mean nothing for us, so get it out of here. But I kind of feel like that's not fair. Like. I don't want to trash the holiday just because it don't mean so much to me specifically. And then I started thinking about Juneteenth and like there's white people like in our circle, good, good, good white people, you know what I'm saying? Who said to me, happy Juneteenth. Mm. And I said, thank you. And now I low-key wish I could go back. And when they say happy Juneteenth, I wish I would have said happy Juneteenth to you too. Because even though it's not directly about y'all, I feel like we should view it as humanity taking a step forward. Mm. Like, it affects all of us. Yeah. Like, even though it's, it is more for us, mm. I feel like as people, we should celebrate any time we take a step forward towards where we need to be. Right, celebrating the wins. Yeah, the win, that's a win. Yeah. So it should so, be so, celebrated, period. We remember the losses, like 9-11. We remember the losses so much. Right. We, we don't we don't take a look back and celebrate what needs to be celebrated. 
that's why it's so, it's so hard for people to to put faith in God and like worship Him, you know, mm-hmm. praise Him because He deserves all of it. Mm-hmm. Amen. Well, that's why that's why I kind of want to stop hating on the Fourth of July because it's like, even though it's not a a win necessarily for us, it's mm-hmm. a win for humanity. Mm-hmm. So I feel like both of those things should be looked at positively, mm-hmm. but you know, wishful thinking. Yeah, but wishful thinking can turn into action. True. Which something as small as what you said, like, can be one of those actions. For me personally, it will be moving forward. Because I've, I've been trashing the 4th of July, mm-hmm. but, like, reason, like this one that just passed, I realized I shouldn't be doing that. Like, because mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a good thing for someone for right reasons. Therefore, mm-hmm. as a human, I should appreciate it. Mm-hmm. See, growing up, I never looked at it like, I, well, the 4th of July, I never looked at it like, oh, I can't wait to celebrate this holiday. Oh, it's going to be great. It, from, like, uh, the American, oh, American patriotic. It's more mm-hmm. of a. I'm excited for this holiday because I know I'm gonna see my friends. I'm gonna know I'm gonna see my family. Yeah. It's gonna be. It's gonna Ch- be a good it's cookout time. day. Cookout <laughs> day. Yeah. Yeah. Am I gonna get canceled for that Juneteenth thing? No. Nah. Why would you get canceled for that? That's true though. Honestly, and I feel like this is something that canceled. we need to be super intentional about as believers because we're supposed to be a family no matter what. Like heaven is going to be, all people coming together to worship God. Mm-hmm. So if we can't do that now, like. It's a problem, and this is this is the real this is the real thing. I wrote this down too. Um, it's something about what. Um, here we go. Here we go. Unity between people who are different but united in Christ is what is going to model to the to the people on Earth what heaven will look like. So again, racism is a huge problem, right? Mm-hmm. In society, you can't deny that. But as believers, no matter our color, our unity is going to show people what and who Jesus is. He said, they'll know you by your love for one another. Are we showing that? That's the question. So I think we need to, all of us need to take steps to make sure that we're loving people. Like we're taking actionable, intentional steps to make sure that we're loving people, no matter the color, and break down these barriers and these things that are are distractions and be the people on earth. Like we would really be the only group that unifies based on a common goal, a common good being Jesus. And no like no other group on the planet is doing that. But Christian could be that group. Yeah. Starts with people just making that decision for themselves personally to like move it forward. Yeah. Shout out to Kevin Gordon. He said this. You can't be a leader unless you're separated. Because when you're separated, people tend to follow. And that's what that's why God calls mm. us to be separate. He also said that it was it was in a song called Lonely. It's one of my favorite songs right now by Kevin Gordon. Anywho, this guy, he said, uh, that when you're leading an orchestra, you turn your back to the crowd. That's good. That's a banger. I'm keeping that. So thank you. That's yeah. lit. Who said that? Caleb Gordon. Oh, man. I'm keeping that. Man. I want to ruin this for other people, uh, just in case. They told me yesterday that red velvet is just chocolate dyed red, and I didn't know that. So, if I'm dumb... It's not, is it? You weren't there for that? No. They told me yesterday at the little at the thing we was doing. There was red like, red velvet, velvet is just... Chocolate. And I was eating the cupcake ha- it halfway through like it. Chocolate. No, as soon as they said it, it tasted like chocolate. I couldn't taste what I was tasting previously. As soon as they said it, and I was like, you know what? This is just chocolate. So if I ruin that for anyone else, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Is that game? I believe so. It's been a pleasure. It's not over, actually. Song <laughs> song, 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 song. Oh, okay. you're right, you're right. Okay, people, I got, I got a banger for you guys. Okay, it's by this group <coughs> I just found. This is a group I just found. It's called Sharp Dialect. Uh, the song is called Grounded. It's it's a single. It's really good. They also have an EP that came out uh, two years ago, but I'm, it's new to me, so it also could be new to you guys. It's called the Till the End EP by Sharp Dialect. Goes really good music because I I know music is one of the struggles for me. You know, making sure I'm listening to the right stuff all the time. So I want to just make sure I can help you guys. So am I am I next? Mm-hmm. Okay. So probably. Probably my favorite gospel song ever that I always suggest to people would be 
For Every Mountain by Kurt Carr. It's just like a super inspirational song that just is thanking God for like giving strength. And it's beautiful. I love it. So check that out. Um, My suggestion is for something that hasn't come out yet, but it's coming out in August. It's called Road to the Father. That's what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> by Dana McQueen. So it'll come out in August. So stay tuned. All right, guys. Uh, takeaways from the conversation to kind of just wait. Up. Quick last question, little okay. little tidbit. Okay. What's, what y'all take on the N word? <laughs> this is this, this is, is not, not a quick last is, no, second. This is not gonna be in this episode. We're we're gonna talk about. Bring me back for that though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, we we'll talk about it after this. But um, that's funny that you just tried to throw that <laughs> yeah, in there. Right. Quick. No, that's gonna that's another it. hour. Okay, so takeaways. Um, I will say, um, part of reconciliation is also like restoring dignity to black people so we understand that like seeing images that look like us and being able to put ourselves in the story of christ is super important uh that's a takeaway number two uh jesus was not white very clear number three white supremacy uh sucks (laughs) and we should take actionable steps to tear it down and four we should love each other as christ loved us and they'll know us by our, our love for one another it's all about love, bro. Right? If your if your friend white, love him as the white brother he is. If your friend's Asian, love him as the Asian brother he is. Man. Shout out, Ethan. Color don't matter, it's man. My guy. Color really don't matter. My biggest takeaway is that we need each other. Like every time that you said we, it needs to be all people. Like we need each other. We can't get anything done universally if we're opposing one another. So we all need each other to move forward. It's better than black and white. Michael Jackson. Little baby. Judeon. Okay, that that too. Mm. All right. I think that's game. Game. Well, folks. I'm Gabe. And I'm Dre. This is the Mutual Friend Podcast. Whoa, whoa. That's he crazy. Didn't, he didn't even... Bro, I don't, bad, don't, do we not need each other? Do, <laughs> do we not need <laughs> each other? <laughs> all right. Is that game? Hey, wait, can you cut that out? No, it's going to stay in. That's going in. This is all going in. Yep. It has to. All right, all right. Is that game? (laughs) You are crazy, (laughs) yo. This is how we end every episode. All right. Is that game? (laughs) (laughs) This this has to stay. I'm Dre. And I'm Gabe. I'm Voodoo. And this has been the Mutual Friend Podcast. Peace. Peace.